Kenya denies human rights abuse of refugees in its push to close the massive Dadaab camp. Good news in the battle against yellow fever in Angola and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And say hello to the robo-taxi. Uber unveils America's first driverless fleet. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. We'll have those stories in a moment. Uh, but first, we'll begin with a new United Nations Refugee Agency report released Thursday indicating that 3.7 million refugee children under the agency's mandate do not have access to a school or even basic education. The report shows that when armed conflict or political instability sent people fleeing from countries across the world, children leave behind not only their homes, but also in many cases their education. Speaking in Geneva, where he released the report, UN Commissioner for Refugees Filippo Grandi said the situation gets worse as the children get older. 50% of refugee children do not have access to primary education, 22% only have access to secondary education and only 1% to university education. This is an area, fundamental area, in which of course the, the, the condition, the status of being refugees shows um, how penalizing it is for young women and men. Grandi says that of course food, water and shelter are the priorities for refugees, but when education is neglected, hope and despair tend to take over. He says that going to school, learning, acquiring knowledge and skills are fundamental to growth in young people. The report provides solid evidence that quality education provides safety, can reduce child marriage, child labor, exploitative and dangerous work, and teenage pregnancy. The UN study also notes the population of school-age refugees grew by 30% in 2014, a number requiring an extra 20,000 teachers. Host nations that in many cases already struggle to provide basic services to refugees must also find a place to hold classes as well as supplies. The world body has asked global donors for $4.5 billion this year to aid Syrian refugees. Funding for education makes up $662 million of that request, and as of June, the UN had collected only 39% of that total. In 2015, the same program saw most of the education funding arrive in the final two months of the year, which the UN said hurt the ability of host countries to make effective long-term plans for schooling. Well, Kenya reaffirmed on Thursday that it will close the world's largest refugee camp in the northeast uh, part of that country by November this year. Now, this comes amid the allegations by Human Rights Watch that it is harassing and intimidating Somali refugees to return home when it's not safe to do so. Now, the rights group says Kenya is not giving the refugees a real choice between being repatriated or staying, and that the United Nations Refugee Agency is not giving refugees accurate information about the risks they face in Somalia. A spokesman for UNHCR in Kenya says the agency would have to study the Human Rights Watch report before responding. Kenya says Al-Shabaab has used the camp as a recruiting ground for its attacks. Kenya softened uh, its stance in June following an outcry from rights groups who said much of Somalia was not yet safe for return. Well, U.S. President Barack Obama welcomed uh, Myanmar's uh, de facto leader Aung San Suu Kyi to the White House this week and had some good news for her and her country's struggling economy after decades of isolation. Here's VOA White House correspondent Cindy Sain. It was not the first time the two leaders had met, but this time it was under very different circumstances. If you had uh, predicted five years ago uh, that uh, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi would now be here sitting uh, as uh, the duly elected representative uh, of her country, um, uh, many people would have been skeptical. Uh, but it's uh, a good news story uh, in an era in which uh, so often uh, we see countries going in the opposite direction. After Wednesday's meeting at the White House, the president had a major announcement. The United States is now prepared to lift sanctions uh, that we have imposed uh, on Burma for quite some time. It is the right thing to do in order to ensure that 
the people of Burma see rewards from a new way of doing business. Aung San Suu Kyi thanked the president and Congress for imposing sanctions on Burma's military to encourage democracy. But she said the time has now come to lift them. But unity also needs prosperity because people, when they have to fight over limited resources, forget that standing together is important. Both leaders urged Americans to travel to and invest in Myanmar, saying it is a beautiful country with a rich cultural heritage. But some human rights leaders have cautioned against a full lifting of sanctions, pointing to Myanmar's mixed human rights record and its indifference to the plight of the country's ethnic Rohingya, considered among the world's most persecuted minority groups. Aung San Suu Kyi addressed ethnic conflicts and said she wants everybody who is a citizen to be entitled to the full rights of citizens. Cindy Sane, VOA News, the White House. We're now going back to our earlier story on refugees. Uh, we head back to we get, head to Kenya, where um, Wenda Njoka, who is the spokesperson of uh, Kenya's Interior Ministry, is standing by. Welcome to Africa 54, Mwenda. Uh, thank you. Now, thank you, you, your government is being accused of uh, harassing and intimidating Somali refugees, basically because they say some are being forced to cross over uh, back to Somalia when they are not happy to do so. It's not safe for them to do so. What's your response? Uh, that is not true. The human rights uh, watch body has a, a tendency to write sensational and unfounded reports on the Republic of Kenya. And uh, for many, they don't see anything positive that the government of Kenya does. So even this one, we are not surprised that uh, they came up with a report that is not based on facts, but uh, fabrications. But there, there is evidence that there's some actually refugees who have come back to Kenya after being uh, repatriated. Is that true? It's not true. How come it's only Human Rights Watch that uh, came? I mean, the Kenyan media has been writing stories about refugees. I've not seen a single story from Kenyan media about uh, refugees. We even have media people we've given uh, access there, BBC and others, and nobody has uh, that kind of a story. And, and then again, the fact that we've had about 30,000 refugees, even as of today, there were about uh, I mean, a number of refugees, more than 1,500, who left for, 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 for Somalia. So it's a, it's a report that is based on a fallacy and it's intended to help them raise funds for their organization, but it has nothing to do with their welfare of refugees. I've also had conversations about the conventions you're using. Are you working under the UN conventions or is it the Africa Union one, which are kind of different in the way you handle what, refugees? What, what, you do, what you're doing, you're working with there under the various, I mean, the, the foremost one is the UN convention where I mean, the non formant where you know you can't take somebody forcefully. And the fact that we have uh, more than 300,000 refugees still in the camps, if you were forcing them, you would have moved them, um, moved them immediately. The government announced that. The fact that there are still refugees who are there in the camps, it means that uh, the government is not, is not forcing them out. Mm -hmm. And then again, the, the, the report by Human Rights Watch is based on a very, what they claim was our, an interview of about 100 refugees who they claim came back. 100 refugees out of 350,000, I mean, it's a very small sample to be, be representative of the views of the refugees. Now, uh, Amanda, but realistically, can you practically close down this camp by November and clear out everybody? Okay, what I can tell you, by November, it's unlikely that we will be able to do that. But the intention of the government, working closely with the government of Somalia, is to have refugees move back to, to, to Somalia as soon as possible. November was our intended date, mm -hmm. but there may be, we may not be able to do it within that period. But right now, we've started the processes. And then, again, what Human Rights Watch are saying, uh, I would like to go back to that, the fact that we are in communication with the Somali government. Even today, we had a meeting with the, with the uh, okay. settlement team of Somali government, about okay, the ministry, and, uh, and, and the, 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 the yeah, to discuss those issues uh, of how... Uh, okay, Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and we'll keep our eye on this story. That is, uh, Mwenda Njoka is uh, Kenya's, uh, spokesman for Kenya's interior ministry well uh when ebola was ravaging west africa can west african countries in 2014 doctors in nigeria managed to stop an outbreak of the deadly disease in a matter of months now that is sto that story is being told on the silver screen chris stein reports from lagos 
It was a grim moment when the Ebola virus arrived in Lagos, a city of more than 20 million people. Spread through contact with bodily fluids, the virus posed an extreme danger in a city where everything from living to working to taking the bus is done in jam-packed conditions. The Nigerian docudrama 93 Days chronicles the desperate days when doctors and public health officials worked to halt the virus before it could spread across Africa's most populous country. They succeeded. Ebola killed eight people in Nigeria, a tiny fraction of the more than 11,000 the virus killed across the region. Producer Bolanle Austin Peters says the movie shows a proud moment in Nigerian history. It's a success story. It's a story of how Nigerians came together to fight this dreadful disease. And um, very rarely do we have this kind of beautiful story being told um, about ourselves. The movie was filmed in the same neighborhoods and at some of the same clinics used to treat patients during the outbreak. That allowed the filmmakers to recreate a unique level of reality in the movie. Some of the doctors were actually there and they were acting as consultants on the movie, so that was really good. So we were saying, did we get this right? Was this how it happened? I remember when we did the spraying of the blood, you know, we shot that about 20 times. It was till we got it right, you know, and the, the doctors kept saying, no, that wasn't how it was, this was how it was. Besides being Africa's largest city, Lagos is an international transportation hub. If the outbreak wasn't swiftly tamped down, many feared it could spread from Lagos globally. Nigerian health authorities collaborated with organizations like the World Health Organization and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control to contain the outbreak. Director Steve Gukas says he hopes viewers will take away the lesson that no country stands alone. We need to actually pay more attention, take more interest when things happen around the world, and do more to help stop things when they start out burning in different parts of the world, that we need to care more, we need to collaborate more, because the truth is the way Nigeria was able to defeat Ebola was through shared collaboration. And it wasn't just collaboration of Nigerians. The movie premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival this month. Gukas says he hopes to distribute 93 days internationally. Chris Stein for VOA News, Lagos. U.S. Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton is resuming her campaigning Thursday after being sidelined with a bout of pneumonia. Her illness became public after she left a 9-11 memorial service in New York City Sunday and was seen on video staggering while getting into a van. In a letter released Wednesday by her campaign, Clinton's uh, doctor says uh, she is recovering well with antibiotics and rest. Now, the episode added fuel to questions about Clinton's health and provided a fresh line of attack for her Republican rival, Donald Trump. But the episode has also raised questions about Trump's own health and increased calls for him to release his full medical records. Well, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we have and join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, the World Health Organization's good news about the yellow fever outbreak in Angola and the DRC. Stay with us. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. They tell you what people are talking about. So for an in-depth look at the stories trending high on social media, Turn to hashtag VOA. It's not your typical talk show. From politics to pop culture, hashtag VOA brings in the people leading the conversation, engages the audience, and gets answers to your questions. Hashtag VOA. Smart talk for smart people. Well, it's time for my health report, and joining us now is Africa 54 Health correspondent Lido Mbidou with a look at what's being done to contain yellow fever on the continent. Lido. That's right. The, the World Health Organization says a yellow fever outbreak in South Central Africa has been brought under control after a vaccination campaign of millions of people. C.V. Bryan, director of the WHO's Infectious Disease Management Unit, told reporters in Geneva Tuesday that no new cases have emerged in either Angola since mid-June or neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo since mid-July. The recent massive vaccination campaign was aimed at not only to stopping the transmission of the mosquito-borne virus, but also to preempt transmission during the upcoming rainy season. 
Brian said a second phase of vaccination will begin soon with 1,000 confirmed cases and up to 6,000 suspected cases of the disease recorded in August. The outbreak is considered the worst in decades among unprotected African populations. Yellow fever has killed more than 400 people. Brian cautioned further outbreaks in 32 endemic countries in Africa could not be ruled out. So far in Angola, uh, more, than five mil 15 million, sorry, more than 15 million people have been vaccinated and so it, this represents 65% of the population. So we can say that uh, we still have to uh, protect uh, certain districts and provinces, but uh, the risk of major outbreak, uh, I think, is now uh, over. The WHO estimates that every 40 seconds someone in the world is committing suicide. It's uh, highly called a health crisis, but it's also a topic that doesn't get talked about. There is a stigma around suicide, and often people think of those who take their lives as cowards. VOA's Carol Pearson tells us about a woman who has dedicated her life to erasing the stigma and preventing people from ending their lives. I was nine when my father took his life. I count that day as the last day of my childhood because from that moment on, I had no sense of security. Dorothy Paw stands before her father's grave at Arlington Cemetery, a place reserved for war heroes. It's important to me that people not label those who die by suicide as cowards um, were here at Arlington because my father was brave. He fought in World War II and, and um, came home and, you know, raised a family and I think he just got overwhelmed. Nearly 50 years later, her life was shaken again. I lost my son in 2012. This is my favorite picture of Peter um, because he has the hint of a smile. It's so understated, but he has piercing blue eyes and he's paying attention. He's um, looking at the world with love, I think. Every year, some 800,000 people die as a result of suicide and many more attempt it. The World Health Organization says this translates to one death every 40 seconds. Beyond this, Suicide impacts families, societies, and communities. The ripple effect is enormous. Um, his brothers, his girlfriend, um, myself, his father. It's a, it's a shock that takes years um, to recover, to find, you know, footing again. Yet experts say suicide can be prevented if governments create policies to prevent alcohol and drug abuse, make guns safer, reduce the stigma of suicide, and provide support for those suffering from depression and diseases that cause depression. Suicide is the ultimate stage four event for a lot of people who have got serious mental illnesses. And frankly, it's a, a ultimate stage four late stage event for a lot of people with other kinds of chronic diseases as well too, who might not have had uh, a mental illness. If we think someone may be troubled, ask them outright if they're having thoughts of suicide. It's not a comfortable conversation, but it's a lot more comfortable than a funeral. And that's my hope and my purpose in speaking. You know, about suicide so that people know that it is preventable. Carol Pearson, VOA News, Washington. Now, after Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton was diagnosed with pneumonia, conversation about the illness increased worldwide. Pneumonia is a contagious, common, and sometimes a lethal lung infection. Common symptoms include feeling tired, coughing, fever, and chest pain that gets worse when coughing. In today's Ask the Expert segment, VOA spoke with Dr. Matthew Schreiber, who specializes in lung disease at the MedStar Washington Hospital Center, and asked him, what is the leading cause of pneumonia? It can happen from any number of organisms, bacterial pneumonia or viral pneumonia. 
in truth, bacterial pneumonia, we have more options to treat. So in some ways, you could make an argument that it's our advantage when it's a bacterial pneumonia. Viral pneumonia, you've all heard of the flu. The flu is an incredibly common infectious process that causes a pneumonia. And truth be told, we don't have many options on how to treat that. <laughs> the severity of it really depends on how that infection has influence that person's lungs and how that person's body is reacting to it. There's no vitamin or pill that you can take to prevent it and you want to have yourself in the best physical state to handle an infection if it comes up. So being active, staying healthy, eating well are all good measures to give your body a reserve to handle an infection. And that was Dr. Matthew Schreiber, lung disease expert at MedStar Washington Hospital Center, speaking with us about pneumonia. If you have a medical question that you would like to have answered, well, tweet me at Lenore Moudou, and we'll have a medical expert respond to your query. Back to you, Vincent. Well, Lenore, thank you very much. Now be sure to watch Lenore Moudou's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. It is time now for a short break. Stay to come on Africa 54. It's the dawn of a new era as Uber launches its first fleet of high-tech cabs. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In Kenya, Human Rights Watch criticizes the involuntary repatriation of Somali refugees from the Dab, saying it breaks international law. In Libya, the National Oil Corporation pledges to restart exports from the port of Zuetina after seizing four ports from a rival force allied to UN-backed government. In Gabon, the African Union plans to assist the country's constitutional court in handling complaints lodged by President Ali Bongo and his rival Jean Ping. In Burkina Faso, prosecutors say the trial of the military perpetrators of the coup attempt against the transitional government is due to open in January next year. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. Let's take a look at what is trending. It's yet another new day in ride sharing. Uber has become the first company to make self driving cars available to the public in the United States. And they've already hit the streets in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, as part of a pilot test program. Uber has picked a group of customers to take free rides in autonomous Ford Fusions with human drivers as backups, of course. If the self-driving cars are able to handle all the road challenges in Pittsburgh, like snowstorms, rolling hills, and a tangled web of aging roads and bridges, then you can certainly expect your first driverless Uber ride to show up at your door pretty soon. Now, tattoos may have a long and colorful history in Japan, if you didn't know. For many Japanese, tattoos are still taboo, despite their appeal for young people. As tattoos go mainstream in many Western countries, a growing number of tourists are finding themselves refused entry to hot springs, pools, gyms, and even some beaches because of their body art. So why the resistance? Gangsters. Tattoos have long been associated with the Japanese mafia and organized crime. Well, with the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo coming up, that should be interesting. Also, very good to know. And finally, early birds camped outside the Apple Store in Sydney the day before the long-awaited launch of the new iPhone 7. Apple enthusiasts set up camping chairs outside the store's main entrance. Some brought along tents. The situation looked pretty much the same in Tokyo. The iPhone 7 has a high resolution camera, but no headphone jack. The biggest surprise was the debut of a three decade old Nintendo game franchise. You may remember Super Mario Brothers on the smartphone. The iPhone 7 goes on sale this Friday. And that is what's trending today. Vincent, back to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Heidi. Uh, now, virtual reality, or VR, is new technology that can have applications in many industries. Uh, companies are popping up as the science of VR continues to improve. 
and uh, it can sometimes be expensive to have um, uh, the equipment to view something in virtual reality. Elizabeth Lee has more. Yosen Utomo does not have a typical job. He spends much of his day looking through tiny lenses and hopes his work will pay off. I think it's in my blood to take risk. Originally from Indonesia, Utomo is one of the founders of Full Dive. With several offices in Silicon Valley and Russia, Full Dive created a free mobile application for anyone with a smartphone to access virtual reality content. It is like YouTube for virtual reality. Utomo started the company two years ago with developing countries in mind. In a third world country, for example, Indonesia or India, we're actually using technologies that is 10 years older, which is, you, than, which is just in Silicon Valley. So our dream is to bring new technologies such as VR, which we are working on, to these countries. So we want to create the bridge. A bridge linking the latest technology in the United States with the rest of the world and making it affordable. First of all, this is a cardboard and this is Google's DIY solution where uh, you actually just use cardboard and just two uh, plastic lenses. Co-founder Ed O says, attach a smartphone to any one of these viewers that can be purchased online for as little as a couple of dollars and users can be immersed in a virtual reality experience. O says the goal is to provide a social platform for all VR content, including games, VR apps, and photos. In the latest feature of the Full Dive app, anyone with a mobile phone or even a 360 still camera can take a photo, upload it onto the Full Dive app, and share it with friends, and your friends will be able to see that photo in virtual reality. O, who has worked in China and the United States, says he tries to bring his experience from both countries to creating the staff that makes Full Dive possible. I want everybody to aim for the best, to do the things that people have never thought of. And that's the culture that we bring here. You know, we're, we're trying to bring VR accessible to everyone, but to, that's a grand vision. How do you do that? There's so many details. And I, you know, we tend to tell people every day, think more detail. Utomo says his goal is to create something that can impact the world. And so far, with 1.6 million downloads of the Full Dive app, he says he is on the right path to making a difference. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News, Berkeley. Well, that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in mornings to Daybreak Africa, between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us here in Washington, have a good night. to the Voice of America's News Words, where we teach you about words in the news. Here is a word that has to do with ships, the sea, and often the military. Maritime. The U.S. Defense Secretary will travel from Hawaii to Japan, which has its own maritime dispute with Beijing. The word maritime has a connection to the seas or oceans. In our story, the maritime dispute is about the argument between Japan and China over control of the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea. You will also hear maritime used in business stories about shipping and transportation on the water. Now, when you hear the word maritime, your American English will be good enough to know what this news word means.